My first chart was talking about uh, uh, two things. Uh, one, introducing the, uh, first of all, saying that George asked me to uh, make this presentation. A picture of mine has earned the uh, honorable mention with the Rookery Bay exhibit. Rookery Bay exhibit is an annual exhibit here in Naples, uh, organized by Rookery Bay and the uh, United Arts Council of Collier. It used to be judged, it's a judged exhibit, and it used to be judged by Clyde Butcher, which gave a, a good prestige to, uh, uh, to that exhibit. Uh, Clyde retired from doing that, and it's Joran uh, Brady now. It is open Florida-wide to anybody, <coughs> any resident, full-time and uh, part-time. So it's a fairly wide audience. Typically, we get uh, entries from all over the, uh, all over the state. Uh, the second one is uh, Canberra, USA. It's organized by what used to be One Living uh, Gallery and uh, uh, Naval Art Association. It is a uh, nationwide exhibit. It's open nationwide. Typically, we get uh, about uh, a little over 50, 60 pictures accepted out of over 200 applications in that one, coming from California to Maine, everywhere in, from everywhere in the country. So, I love photography, and uh, my main interest is uh, uh, presenting pictures to jury exhibits and uh, to uh, competitions in general. So those are the two that uh, I have now done for years. And George had asked me to show the progress of a picture that eventually makes a, one of these jury exhibits and earns uh, some recognition there. By the way, uh, both Camera USA and uh, and uh, Rookery Bay, we want to be in it. The, the first thing is not so much to win, but just to get accepted. It's, uh, uh, you, you put something in there, your chances are one out of four or one out of five that the jurors will accept it. The Camera USA <coughs> jurors are chosen from uh, nationwide universities or museum curators so they are very highly qualified uh, uh, non-local uh, jurors. My intent with my photography is not to generate too many pictures. I take a lot, but I choose very few which I develop. And I'd like to capture my feeling, my uh, impression of what I photograph as opposed to just the waterfall or just the building or, or, or just the, uh, the landscape. My goal is I consider the picture to be successful if it grabs your attention, otherwise you walk by it. It evokes an emotion, and also the picture should some should show something new, at least. Sometimes just in content, sometimes in style. Uh, I was in uh, Yosemite a couple of years ago, and all the time, what was in my mind that there's not a stone there, not a, a tree there. Mm -hmm. Not anything there that has not been photographed by millions of people. So how can I, from Ansel Adams to <coughs> Clyde Butcher, uh, and how can I take pictures that are still interesting and, and 
different. Uh, when we sub submit pictures uh, to uh, either exhibits or just competitions, the judges typically have, it, it varies all over the place, but typically they have uh, impact judged composition, how impact would be how, how does it feel, what, what impact is, does it give. It's not just a visual impact, it's also the emotional impact. <clears throat> composition is whether or not it's, it, it's a pleasing uh, composition. You might present a beautiful flower surrounded by ugly black background. They wouldn't like that. Uh, the background should kind of support the subject and nicely laid out within the frame of the picture and of course the technical quality. There is a conundrum, there is a problem that we have to overcome. That problem is that in every picture there are three of us. There is me, there is the camera, and there is you, the viewer. The camera looks at it cold hearted. The camera has no feeling. Uh, it just captures the light. You and I, whatever you look at, you don't see it until your brain processes it. So therefore, we all see different. We all see different even as, as you look, as you look at the picture, your emotions maybe nothing, maybe something, they would be all different. So, when I take the picture, the camera does not see exactly the same thing what I do. And when I process my picture, when you look at the result, you see something different. So, that needs to be overcome to some extent if, I, if the picture has to be what if you want the sixth picture to be uh, successful. Ansel Adams has many, many, many quotes, and I love most of them, all of them. Uh, one of it says, the negative is the score, the print is the performance. thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. What, what that means, really, is the score is gold. The, the score is, you, you can't give the score to the audience to enjoy. The music is performed by someone, and you might enjoy one person's performance of the same song or of the same music, uh, and not as it comes from someone else. You, the photographer, have to put something of yourself into the picture between capturing it and presenting it. Uh, whether you know it or not, the 20th century's photographers spent hours and hours and hours and days and days in the dark room. They manipulated their pictures to put themselves into that image. When, when it comes out. And uh, it is digital photography, it's a com computer, it's a Mac, which became, in my case, I always dreamed to have a dark room when I retired. And luckily by the time the house was built, I could realize that my Mac will be my dark room. It was early Photoshop, but I could uh, I could see what's coming, not not what's coming, but it, I could see that it will be it. Uh, much easier, much faster, and much, much less expensive. So I consider my camera my tool when I out there to capture something, but in my mind I try to remember what it is, what it was, how I felt, and most of the time, of course, when I process 
process my pictures, sometimes it, it changes, sometimes it, I discover something in there that I didn't see. But in general, it, it is at that point when I want to create the same or similar feeling that you, when you view that picture, would get out of that, out of that picture. Not just it's everything sharp and everything uh, is perfect, but that there is a mood that was captured and that mood comes at you, evokes some feelings in you when you look at the picture. So when I develop a picture, I look at it, I assess what is there, I kind of try to envision what I want, and then I try to bridge that gap. I try to, when I say bridge that gap, is not just show what, what I want to show, but try to show it without altering <coughs> anything in the picture. Now, I have a, a little bit later about altering pictures, but it's very, very simple. It goes from nothing to everything. It all depends where your picture goes. If you are a forensic photographer, if you take a picture for insurance, absolutely nothing. If uh, the rules say don't touch your picture, absolutely nothing. But even journalists can do certain alterations. Uh, not much, but certain alterations. But when you are a photographer and you are your intent is to put pictures forward to competition or jury exhibits, read the rules and go buy it. And the rules are usually reasonably clear what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do. For example, uh, for Rookery Bay, it has to be nature, it has to be unaltered nature. Uh, for Camera Raw, it just has, has to be, uh, I don't exactly remember the, the exact rules, but uh, uh, you can use certain techniques like HDR, which is high uh, dynamic range when the, the light is from very bright to very dark. You can take three pictures and combine the three to get a, a, a usable image out of it. There are certain things that are a lot, others that are not. But um, uh, personally, I always develop my pictures. I always work on them, usually a fair amount of time, but not always, and uh, before, before I show. Now, why is that their gap? Why is that? between uh, what you get out of the picture and uh, what you want to put in the picture. There are some, some reasons, very, uh, well, not physics, but physiology oriented. Uh, depth per perception. When you are out in the field, you see depth and size in three dimensions. When you present it in the picture, it's two dimensions. Uh, you very often have to do certain things to put back the dimension. Uh, for example, depth is uh, when you're out there, never been in Africa, but let's say you're in Africa and there's a tree and there's a tiger. The tri a tiger is moving this way, you know which is closer, the tree or the tiger, when it goes by the tree and if it covers the tree, then it's uh, closer to you than the tree. When you take the picture, you don't want the tree to come out of the head of the lion either and you take it somewhere else. So your mind remembers that it was closer, your viewer will have no clue. 
and that's just one type of clue that gives depth. Um, very often you see sharp pictures from front to back, but it doesn't give you the dimension because your mind expects the distance to be a little hazier, a little less sharp, often a little uh, less contrasting than the nearby. So by altering the image a little bit in that direction can give back the truth, give back the feeling, the clues when you view the image uh, of what you have seen. So those are the kind of things I like to do and uh, as time goes on learn more and more of these kind of uh, tricks you might call that put back the uh, perception of the reality from the two-dimensional picture of your, the viewer that I have because I was there and when I look at it my mind sees what it remembers not just what's on that. So very often people look at my picture or your picture and they don't quite understand what's there. And you wonder why. And that's because the mind, the first thing the mind does, have I seen it before? That's the first, when I look at something, the first thing the mind tells you, have I seen that before? And if your picture has something that the mind have saw, saw before, that's where your viewer will come. Uh, shapes are the first thing the viewer looks at. The second thing the viewer looks at is the, what's the brightest. And then goes down the list of contrast and a few other things. So if you look at master's uh, pictures, you'll find that they lead you. They lead you in, your, in their pictures. Uh, in where do you look first and how you move your eye in that picture. So, uh, Enceladus also is said to have asked some, some or confronted some, time, some point with the statement by someone. Uh, yeah, but the camera cannot capture move, mood. You talk about mood, the camera can capture mood. And his answer was, the camera cannot, but the photographer can. So what I'm trying to do is capture that mood and use these tools of adjusting contrast, brightness, sharpness in the picture so that the viewer gets the reality, the depth, the mood of the scene. Uh, I already talked about uh, restrictions. Just one thing I want to say, uh, contrast. Contrast is very important in your pictures, but contrast is not just white to dark. Contrast is also warm colors to cold colors, uh, sharpness to softness, and a few other things in the picture where you realize, and color, uh, what are the words for colors in the color wheel that are opposing colors versus adjacent colors, uh, manipulation of those. These are the things that you don't want to change your picture, but you want to emphasize these things. You want to get uh, them to the point where it grabs your audience and pleases your, your audience or your viewers. Uh, I included a couple of uh, photo pops in Naples. Um, I'm involved. We are uh, very active. Uh, George, I, I will give you this uh, presentation and, and when you distribute it. Uh, you will have the information. And if you are a photographer, if you love photography, even if you're part-time, I recommend uh, interest in uh, the two clubs. The two clubs are very different. Uh, would not be 
the right time to get into the uh, details on, on that. So I thought I talk about uh, this much, and I used the rest of the time to show pictures, uh, do exactly what George asked me to do, uh, talk about, for example, or starting with how this picture that I had up front This picture, which won the, uh, I don't have it printed because the print is, is still hanging there. It is hanging at Rugby Bay. Uh, the exhibit is still open till the end of March. It's a wonderful exhibit. I do recommend Rugby Bay is uh, just south of 41 and 951 intersection. Uh, the uh, uh, road to Miami intersecting the road to uh, uh, Marco Island, uh, just south of it in Zuccari Bay. And the exhibit is, is really very, 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 very nice. Lots of bird pictures. Uh, a couple of people told me here interested in bird. Uh, and uh, uh, if there, there, there are the winners, first, first, second, third place. Yeah, really wonderful pictures. So, for this exhibit, the uh, deadline was December 5th. We submit JPEG pictures, small little JPEG pictures, uh, for acceptance. And then uh, the judge or judges select out of those JPEG pictures the ones that are accepted. And when they let us know what it is, uh, either you have it or you scramble to get it. We have, uh, uh, just before Christmas, we were notified and the delivery was beginning of March. So we had two months. Get it printed. For uh, I have it. This one printed on acrylic, and uh, the reason I chose that is acrylic. The picture is on the back of the of a uh, quarter inch or half inch or one inch acrylic, so the light gets also into the acrylic from the side, and helps giving back the strength of the light and the impression of the light coming from the sun. So that's the reason why I chose it. I have a picture here which uh, is also on acrylic, so I will show that, uh, that picture. But of this one, I don't have a print. Uh, it's about 20 by 30 size. By the way, we have to give, commit the size at the time when we put in the JPEG. Now, that will come back when I talk about another one of the pictures. So December 5 was the date. It's a Monday. The Tuesday before, we were walking out of the uh, uh, club meeting with a friend of mine. He says, what pictures did you put in? To Rookery Bay. And I said, I tried and tried and tried, and I had nothing that I thought was good enough to put in. He said, You must put in something. So it was on the Wednesday, uh, the Thursday after, that I went out. So you hadn't taken this picture yet? Pardon me? At that time, I had not, I had not taken that picture. At that time, I did not have this picture. So I, I said, I, I said to, uh, to myself, 
Two weeks ago, at that time, I was out at Loverski. Loverski is just uh, south on the road that goes from uh, Bonita Estero into uh, uh, Fort Myers Beach. A mm -hmm. uh, beautiful place, and if you just walk down there to the Gulf, to the right, there are all these trees. And uh, I, took, I took that picture about two weeks before, before that. I didn't like it. I didn't do anything with it. But I said, well, I remember another tree there. <laughs> so when I went up there on Thursday, I knew all I had to keep my fingers crossed <laughs> in my sunset. So I knew that uh, I do have a good exposure. I do have, uh, I remember, half remembered that other tree. Uh, so I went there, set myself up straight the way you saw that picture, and I took a number of pictures. On a tripod? On a tripod, yes, absolutely, on a tripod. With what camera? Uh, my camera is a Nikon D850, which happens to be the absolute top, one of the absolute top three cameras, or top two cameras, really, uh, for not professional. In other words, there is that, uh, what is it called, uh, uh, semi, not semi-professional, but, but uh, amateur, not, not, not amateur, it's a, something like a, commercial. Anyway, it, it's the, the hybrid between amateur and professional. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been so successful that uh, I, we had a conference here, a, a three-day full-fledged conference with, uh, I think you heard the names, uh, Vincent Versace, uh, he was one of the speakers, and some others. They use that camera now almost exclusively because of its, its high quality. So it's a very high quality. <coughs> Who makes it? Nikon. 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 The oh. other uh, <coughs> of the top cameras is, is uh, uh, Sony. Uh, Sony has risen very, very high. I personally don't like it because it's a, uh, to me, it's a miniature PC, not Mac. <laughs> that has to be treated as a PC settings and everything and I just uh, had to, I tried it, fuss with it more uh, in terms of settings and making it work than get a very good quality picture but, but uh, I just prefer, between the two I prefer the Nikon. The big difference for years, for cameras, was the number of pixels. The number of pixels is now so high, so good enough, that improving the number of pixels barely has any effect on the quality of the images. The research and the quality improvements go into what's called the dynamic range. What is the brightest and darkness, darkest in the scene that a single shot of the camera can take in? Now what's important uh, to you is to understand no matter what camera you use, you must not overexpose. When you overexpose a picture, there is no detail. It captures absolutely no detail. It's white. When you underexpose, the problem is noise. And I'll talk about noise with my next 
next or second next picture. Uh, noise you can deal with to some extent, but lost data, data that you did not capture is not there. So you have a blank white area in, in your image. And the Sony and Nikon, actually Nikon uses the Sony sensor in the camera and the two cameras are the best in terms of what they can uh, achieve. So this is a single picture. How much does it such a camera cost? $3,300 roughly. Um, there is the 810 in Nikon that I used before. It is slightly under, well, under that quality. In, in price, it's now down at about $1,700. And I'm showing uh, So, with one picture, I could bring more detail into the dark area. And more light into the, the rest. I'll show you uh, the next one. So, when I went back, bracketed my pictures. Bracketing <coughs> means that I uh, take two, three, four, five, six, usually it's, it's an odd number, three, five, seven, or nine images over and under exposed. <coughs> uh, I did not take it to HDR is the process high dynamic uh, range. HDR software is the process that takes the three pictures, and some cameras can do it inside the camera now, <coughs> and combine the three pictures into one that take every piece of information available only in the, black, in the dark and available <coughs> in the light. They combine it all together. But my purpose with bracketing is just to take the best of the three. So I have, I, I think the middle one is the, is the right one for me, but then I can try both the middle one and one other, and whichever works better for me. So uh, I took the, uh, the three bracketed pictures, many, many, many times as the sun was setting, and then I selected a particular one out of all of those, which was this. As you can see, there is far not as much life in this picture as the one that was up there before, and you can see how with these sliders, this is the Adobe Camera Raw uh, software, which is part of Photoshop. It's part of Photoshop Elements as well, and it's part of Lightroom as well. So either one of them you use, you have this, these capabilities. In Lightroom, it looks a little different, but it's exactly the same software behind it. So with this, you can change the contrast. Uh, the dark, as you can see, the blue coming up there. Can you see the blue and the red? Those are just warning signals. The red says, whoops, you have no detail in that area because it's all white. The blue says, whoops, you have no detail there because it's all black. So, typically, I try to avoid all the, uh, the red ones, although with the sun, I can afford to be 
without detail because we never look into the detail in the sum. So I can go as far as filling that area with the sum if I want to. But everywhere else I want detail. So with these sliders, I can play, and you can, until the image gives you <coughs> more or less what you want it to be. I wanted it to be a little more uh, dramatic. And I ended up sp spending very little time on this picture because there's not that much to, to work on, except I ended up spending a lot of time on uh, well, I have a pointer somewhere, I just did not get it out, uh, on, on the tree. What I wanted the tree to be is that if I stand about this far from the picture, all I see is the silhouette. It's dark. When I come close to it, I begin to see details. That was my criteria for, for that tree. Grab the attention as a silhouette, but have the detail in the image. And not too difficult to get it in here, because one of the sliders, this shadow slider is very, very powerful to go a long way. Oh, sir, thank you. And down here, I don't mind if there is a little bit of dark black. It gives contrast to the picture. But I wanted the light in the water. I wanted some dimension <coughs> in the sand. Not much, but some dimension. So the manipulation of the relative darkness in the dark areas and the uh, the the light on the other end, the brightness, the light of the sky. Those were my objectives with the picture. The time I had spend that is when I took it to the printer. The tree didn't come out the way I wanted it. So I asked for a proof and had to go back and forth with the proof to get the tree exactly like I wanted. Uh, can you say anything about this famous rule of three for composition? Uh, uh, the rule of third for composition <coughs> It's called rule of thirds. I call it a two of thirds. The reason I call it a two of thirds as opposed to the rule is it's not a rule, but it's a tool to make a picture a little more attractive to the eye. It doesn't work all the time, but you always need to try it. Almost always need to try it. There are some pictures that have to be, and it's better if the baby face is right in the middle or something else. But if that tree <coughs> was exactly in the middle, this picture would not be balanced. It, it, there would be nothing interesting on the left. And frankly, uh, when I cropped this picture, not much cropping. There was no more room on the left. Uh, and I felt that this was the most balanced situation that I could get out of it. Uh, on the left, there is enough that I'm not cutting off anything. On the right, there is the interest, and the tree with slightly left from the center, not quite one third, gives me a balance. But the rule of thirds in some competitions is a must. Some judges, I, I, I seen them, they, they, they are they're blind to it. If it's not rule of thirds, if it's not exactly rule of thirds, then it's not a good picture. I, I say it's a tool. 
use it because it's a very important tool. It's like hammer and screwdriver. It's you can't do anything without it, but you don't need it all. But if you look at that picture, the tree in the true rule of third would be a little bit more to the left, because it's a little bit to the right of where the left third would have really placed it. Yeah. Yeah. And it may be better, but but I couldn't crop it that way. But I, I yeah. If for the people that doesn't have a three thousand dollar camera, if you took this with an iPhone, how much difference would we see? If you took it the that iPhone way? in many respects is almost a three thousand dollar camera. <laughs> <laughs> really really it, 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 the reason for that the reason for that is that nobody has an image stabilization ability like Apple. Yeah, they, they, the image stabilization, in other words, the ability that you can take the picture without the image uh, moving uh, gives them a, a huge, huge, huge advantage. Uh, they can also do HDR inside inside the camera. So if you set your iPhone to HDR, it says HDR, then you can, uh, it will take you three pictures or five or whatever, you don't know how many, and show you one that is a combination of. So it will take those three pictures that I showed you first and combine them. So it will get in the dark and day. The problem is noise. And I will show you with another picture. I have, I have time. Uh, uh, what noise is and when you print it? Where you print it? Uh, there are three printers I use, or club members tend to use. Uh, one of them is High Tech, H I T E K. High Tech is just off Radio Road in one of those commercial areas, but H I T E K may folks give you, if we Google it. They are the greatest in using different substrates. The substrate is paper you print on or aluminum to print on or wood they print on almost and if you have some nice pictures you want uh, uh, the uh, something on the table or little things for tiles in, in your kitchen whatever uh, they print on anything that's high tech cool. uh, there is eight uh, GNH photo uh, it's run by a lady who, whose clientele is larger plain painters. So if you have a picture where you are very fussy about the colors, the exactness of the colors, and an exact uh, copy of what you have, they call it pieces, I believe, for, for printers, uh, she is particularly good at that. Uh, GNH is on old, off old uh, 41, uh, railroad head, railhead, railhead, yeah. on railhead, and again, you can move, uh, and uh, Dennis Goodman is uh, right in the center of uh, Naples in that uh, commercial area at the corner of uh, Vanderbilt and uh, Vanderbilt and Airport Road, the uh, just south of um, uh, what is it? Uh, <coughs> the big, big, expensive community. Coming? <laughs> Now, anyway, it's it's uh, Dennis Goodman. Uh, he prints beautiful paper work, 
and get it nice, very nicely framed and so on. How do you know the picture that you see on your screen is going to actually be the same color as the color that you actually printed? Oh, <laughs> you know, uh, there are there are methods to bring it close. It's called color management, and uh, color management starts with uh, uh, calibrating your screen so that your screen and the numbers that Photoshop sends to the screen are at a universal universally accepted uh, uh, level and therefore when you put it into uh, uh, Walmart or, or, or Costco for printing uh, you get the same thing also uh, you can only really get this close if you have a profile and the profile is the printer and paper it's not just a printer profile, it's not just how your printer relates to the numbers that you send it, but it's a profile how the printer with a particular paper will behave. So if you have a good printer profile, uh, printer paper profile, then you get close. Close enough that one or two uh, proof prints We'll, we'll get you there. So you look at the print, small, and you see the difference, you manipulate it to not enough, usually it's darker, usually it's less contrast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you adjust it and print again. <clears throat> and then you go large and you find that you didn't quite done it and you need a second one. So the adjustments are made on by the, by eyeballing, and they're made on the printer or on the computer. A computer. computer. The printer does not do anything. Okay. The printer just behaves what you tell, if if at all. So it's the printers are still the the worst things in the computer. So the adjustments <coughs> are done in a. The, uh, I have the, the file, and I call this my master file. And when I try to print it, different papers, it might the adjustment might be different. So I'm not a good record keeper, but in theory, I would keep record of how it I did it on two or three different papers. So we can go I back and you had a printer. You have happened. you have to burn the ink and burn the mm -hmm. paper. So you, you had to keep going back and forth to the acrylic place. Uh, I had to go back and forth the acrylic place just before I had a trick and all that, but, but I, I managed. So this acrylic print that you maybe had to make two or three times? No, no, no. They, they, they have a good process. Once they show me the, the, print, the proof print, their acrylic will look the same. They, they are much more disciplined and much more controlled, better controlled. You or I can be, but yes. Well, just oh, Ryan, I'm curious <laughs> about the lenses that you use on your Nikon camera and how critical that is to your to your shooting photography. My style is such that uh, I usually I, I I look at things and I I see the big things. Some other photographers see the small things. Uh, very few of my topics are very critical. So I don't use super expensive lenses, but I use I don't use the cheap ones either. So there are three layers of lenses. One uh, tends to be, well, different length with different price range, but tends to be under the uh, uh, 200 mark or something very inexpensive lenses. I don't use those or let's say up below five, six hundred. Uh, tend not to use them anymore. There is the 1,000 to 2,000 range, around 1,000 range, uh, which 
are most of my lenses, and uh, over 2,000, I don't. Is I this a prime one? one? I think I have one. Is this a prime one that you use? 50 millimeter? Uh, 24 to 120, set to 40 millimeters. It's a zoom up there in the right hand corner, you can see it, 24 right. to 120. That's a, I think now it's $1,400, dollars lens. If you had taken this with the, with an iPhone, with an iPhone, and you try to print it to the size that you submitted, that's where the iPhone fails. Okay, the iPhone cannot print big pictures. They, they well, I have printed 17, 16 by 20 iPhone pictures, but when I want to go beyond that. You just get blurred. It it gets uh, yeah not 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 sharp enough. Yeah. Uh, one moment. One moment. Uh, Do you have a favorite for um, the printers? For uh, the between, brand of printer? Between the three. Oh, the printers. Yes. Oh, I use Epson. I use Epson. Mm -hmm. I I think uh, Canon is coming up with it. Um, HP is very reliable, very good. I use Epson. And you use the uh, the uh, dot, the, the, not not the laser printer. Use a uh, uh, inkjet printer. Oh, ink, inkjet printer. Yes, Tom. Yeah, two questions. One, you said the bracketing on this one. Do you do that manually, or your camera does that automatically? The camera. I have my camera does it. My my camera. I can set my camera. That's right. If you can set, typically you can set your camera, you think you want your exposure here, you can set it so that it will take one here and one there. Uh, but you can also set it, you know you don't want to go above that, you can also set it to this and then take a couple of down or take a couple. Thank you. The other question is what lens do you typically use a zoom lens or? Uh, what percentage of the time I, don't, I, 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 I have more lenses than I use. Uh, I, uh, I like this one. This is a very, very good lens uh, for my level of photography, my purposes. Uh, I use this a lot. I need one that's wider angle. And I have one that goes 70 to 300, which I find not enough if I really want to take a bird or, or animal pictures. Uh, and because I begin to feel that my camera and lenses are getting too heavy, <laughs> somehow gravity <laughs> grows. Uh, I don't know, like probably does, maybe not. I just get older. But uh, so I, I'm thinking of, of switching to Sony because it's a it's a new technology, much lighter camera with the same quality. So I didn't buy any lens yet, but I need a longer lens. Mm -hmm. I need a longer lens that I don't. Let me go on to to. Uh, uh, so you took the picture on the 30th, and it was due on the 5th of December. Oh yeah. So so. Uh, <laughs> So, but and then you went on the JPEG, the okay. JPEG, not the print. Oh, oh not the print. Okay. Okay, the JPEG. So I had uh, this time uh, to do the paperwork because there's some paperwork, some payment. Uh, I didn't have time to mail it. I had to drive down to Pine Ridge, <laughs> the <laughs> office, and submit it there. Uh, JPEG on my computer and the paperwork. So in order to get this to the level that you really wanted to submit, you only use the sliders, the... Uh, the, the I don't remember. No, no, I, I did one more. Uh, I did, but but it's, it's a technique that uh, you can do in Photoshop, uh, masking, layers and masking. Uh, you can alter things, uh, 
Well, actually, a very, very good point I wanted to make. There was somewhere on the slides, global and local, those two terms. It, when I talk about adjustments, global and local. Uh, when you make an adjustment, like my sliders here, I'm making a global adjustment. Mm -hmm. Whatever I do affects more or less everything in the image. Mm -hmm. Local adjustments are crucial for good pictures, where you manipulate the contrast or color or whatever locally to only where you want it to do. And in Photoshop, there, there are many ways to do it, but one of them is to create masks. I, it's like a stencil. When you put it on the wall and you paint on it, you only paint where the stencil mm -hmm. does not cover mm -hmm. the wall. Okay? And that's a mask, and I had a mask for the tree, and I had a mask for the sand so that I could manipulate the darkness of the tree independent of the rest of the picture and the darkness of the sand independent of the rest of the picture. Because you can see that there is a little bit of, uh, of uh, structure in that sand, actually more than what the projector shows here. Down here, so you, you can see the the sand has a little bit of uh, uh, not just texture in it, but also dimension. And as I said, I was very critical about the tree. So I had a mask. Those two fine scale uh, 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 adjustments were really very important in them selecting your picture for this project? Uh, at that point, that, that's the one I had for this one, and I submitted it, and kept my fingers crossed. <laughs> so as it turned out, it was not only accepted, but it was, uh, uh, we had, I think, uh, one first place, second place, third place, and four or five honorable mentions. So about 10% of the pictures. Do, do they give you feedback on what they how oh, they yeah, I, I, in every every exhibit or every competition when I have access to the judge uh, I do uh, I do ask for a critique I, I, I go to the judge and ask for a critique. If you hadn't gone to the judge, would you have gotten it anyway? I'm sorry? Would you get the uh, critique anyway? <coughs> uh, I, I, I like, uh, well, I didn't have time in this one, but we have little bit of friendships within the club. Okay. And we but you don't get a written report back from the judge? No, nothing of that sort, no. Have you ever been a judge? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I took uh, uh, a little bit of a training and, and passed it and uh, for local clubs, for our local clubs, not uh, uh, actually I judged for uh, statewide club competition and uh, prints and uh, just last Friday and coming Friday, we'll, uh, in Fort Myers, the Fort Myers clubs. Uh, and at the uh, Naples Camera Club, every two weeks, uh, the meets every two weeks in the season. And every two weeks there's a competition. And the competition is within the club, even, that's where I judged first, even without any training. We, it's, it's just uh, practicing members to judge each other's pictures. And uh, it's, it's a good, uh, good practice. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Clyde and me when these two 
uh, on the last uh, uh, exhibit that he judged, these two pictures of mine were uh, honorable, received honorable mention. And um, uh, it, it was why he judged. And I asked him about this, uh, this picture first, uh, the one that you see. I live at Longshore Lake, Maryland. That's Longshore Lake. I, I knew I could tell by the cypress knees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's in co our community kept uh, untouched an area around the bridge. If you go one inch up, you see the concrete of the bridge. <laughs> and, uh, but that's genuine uh, cypress uh, trees. And I titled that, by the way, titles are important. And I titled that uh, uh, Knights of K-N-I-G-H-T. Knights, Knights of the Evergreen. What did you title the one that uh, you showed originally? Uh, that one is simply uh, Lover's Key Sunset. This was another one. It's on, uh, he's covering it up, that's on aluminum. It's here, you can see it after the meeting. It's, it's a frog on a leaf. And when I found out that the frog is a uh, Cuban tree frog, and it's not liked <laughs> here, and I knew that Clyde would not like it. <laughs> I titled it Invader. <laughs> but it's important that you title. I, I had a title about that long, and then I started to go down, and, and I found out why not just call it Invader. <laughs> so that, uh, that was that. Now, the other one I wanted to really spend a little time on. And yeah, I still have probably enough time. I have also a uh, an acrylic print here that you can see after. This one made it to Camera USA uh, last year. Uh, I took a picture that I really, really like and love. By the way, why are you looking around? The one you finally submitted, how many did you take that day before you settle on that particular one? I took a lot because the sky changed. I mean, so as the, the sun was as, as the sun was setting, I just went. Bum, bum, bum. I Maybe put fifty or or a hundred or ten or what? Uh, between fifty and uh, probably around fifty would be a good number. Mm -hmm. yeah. but it 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 was a changing scene, and the choice eventually I made was the clouds, well, the where place. those moving clouds mm -hmm. were, and how high was the sun. But also within that, if you remember the water, there's a little wave there, mm -hmm. and there is a, a dimension in the water that was also part of the choice. Because I mean, when I when I take multiple pictures, each one of them is a beauty in my mind. So picking which one you actually take is very hard choice. Absolutely. Now this this was a picture that I really really love. And uh, uh, I'm not going to spend time to, to show you uh, what it took to make it a, a, a nice picture, but... Where is this? It's Everglades, but entered from the uh, Miami side, uh, close to it. So I'm not, I'm not going to play with it too much, but it's a sunrise and uh, 
original, you saw the original, and then um, this is what what it became, and I loved it. So I was on a workshop with the Miami uh, Leica people, of all places. Uh, they let me use their Leica camera, and I uh, got up to take that picture, and the battery went off, so I had to run back, get my Nikon, <laughs> get my Nikon, and the sun was a little higher than I wanted by that time, but I still took my picture. So it's a Nikon picture, not a Leica picture. But they offered free 30 by 40 prints. So I love this picture, and I said, okay, this is what I put in Rookery Bay. And that's 2015. Uh, and I did. And I committed to 30 by 40 size. I said earlier, you have to commit when you put the chain back in. Now, when I got back, <laughs> see the noise? Oh, yeah. That's when I got back, and I almost fainted. <laughs> I, I expected the beautiful blue water, what you saw there, and there was all that, all that noise. And I had very little time <laughs> from there. At that time, there was a printer at uh, uh, High Tech, sadly he died, and he gave me wonderful time, uh, wonderful help. We, uh, we, we told him. I took it there, and he said, this is junk. Let me go and see you at, at your home in, with your computer to see what was wrong. He pointed out to me the noise problem, and I had to rework the whole thing and have it reprinted because I committed to 30 by 40. So when you go large size, noise is, is really critical. But noise these days is uh, much easier to control. Now noise comes in the dark areas in your picture and in if you underexpose. But you have to underexpose if you don't want to burn out the white areas. So that's yeah. when the difficulty that's when the difficulty, that difficulty comes in. Because our eyes, as we look around, adjust very quickly to the light versus the dark and uh, and the camera camera does not so we have to overcome that problem now there may be time to show you one more thing that uh, this was my first ever This was my first ever uh, com com competition entry in uh, in Marco Island in a Marco Island competition. camera club asked us to take pictures of doors and gates mm -hmm. and I took a picture of this and uh, to come back so um, from this I tried to make a decent picture Somehow I found that color, I 
think I took it from this tree, put it on the gate, and then I saw the opportunity to, uh, to, to make it the way I, I showed it to you, and uh, gate to the sanctuary was the title, and it was a conservation-oriented exhibit, and it got uh, uh, best in show. Wow. That was 2008. Wow. That was 2008. But not this. Not this. It was the way it was done. And at that time, I had to work every little detail. Like, where is it green, like here? Where is it black, like there? Uh, every little detail by hand. Today I can do it with masks and magic. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, Bob.